today we're very fortunate that we have a panel on um, res resiliency and network performance um, when a low impact high imp or when a low uh, probability high impact event happens. Um, when I was coming up um, many, many years when I was younger, reading about the int original internet architecture, people talked a lot about how the internet was made um, to be extremely resilient, that even a, a nuclear war, which um, I grew up worried about in my youth, um, would, not, would, would, would not affect the internet too much. It would just rot around um, the damage. Um, and we've never had a, thankfully, we've never had an opportunity to test um, that theory, that um, fortunately, but you know, it, it, this COVID-19 with everybody working from home and streaming Netflix from home and, and other things like that um, has really created this kind of uh, low probability, but high impact event. You know, typically systems um, aren't uh, designed uh, to handle massive surges in traffic. Um, Cloudflare did uh, a report recently, actually in, 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 at the beginning of the lockdown, showing that the network surge, uh, the internet you know, performed as expected, um, whereas other systems probably wouldn't have. Um, for example, on 9-11, uh, the phone network didn't really respond uh, very well to everybody picking up the phone and calling their loved ones to see if they were safe. Um, there, was a, there was a massive, it, the network wasn't prepared for that. Um, in the earthquake in Washington, DC a decade ago, um, uh, which is pretty extremely rare, uh, the federal government decided to let everybody out um, early, early, release from their work and um, the streets of DC were not prepared for how all those employees getting in their cars and driving home at the same time. So um, it was a massive traffic jam in DC. Systems aren't designed like that, but the internet um, was designed like that. So today um, we wanted to have um, two experts, uh, Nick Deemster, who is a computer science professor at the University of Chicago. Um, you may not re recall Nick while he was working at Princeton uh, the Computer Science Department, which is um, very well known in internet policy circles. He's taken his talents to Chicago. Um, which is great. Um, and Nick is going to be in here talking about his recent paper, um, as is Matt Tooley, who's vice president and of broadband technology at NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. Um, he's also, um, he works on the Broadband Internet Technical Advisory Group, or BITAG, BITAG. Um, and actually, Matt got his master's at the University of Chicago. Um, so there was kind of this trend of like, looks like University of Chicago people are really taking over internet policy. Um, for you watching yesterday, Genevieve Lakier, uh, the professor, um, was really, uh, really great on that section, feisty section 230 panel. Um, and she's also from the University of Chicago. So um, let me just start off with um, Nick. Nick, you just wrote this big paper on characterizing service provider response to the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. Um, I will put a link in the chat uh, to that paper if you haven't read it. But, you know, just kind of give us a just, just real quick rundown of like how the internet performed during covid I think the main thing to, to take away, Tim, is that the internet performed very well during COVID. There was, of course, uh, uh, a little bit of a stress test, uh, particularly in, in mid-March with the shift uh, to working from home, schooling from home with the stay-at-home order. Uh, the stay-at-home order is going in effect in, in various states across the country. Um, and and the, the traffic shifts are evident. You know, you can see uh, substantial increases in, in traffic volume, um, in um, in particularly in, in in certain types of services, streaming video and and so forth. Um, and you can you can certainly see uh, changes in traffic ratios as well, because everybody's doing video conference from home. You can see certainly uh, for certain uh, interconnects. Uh, an increase in upstream traffic from the ISP to those service providers. Um, and there were uh, there was certainly a brief period uh, that's evident in the FCC's Measuring Broadband America data. That was one of the sources that we looked at, um, as well as other sources that I think Matt will talk about, where you can certainly see uh, some blips on some ISPs in, in um, you know, uh, in particularly in isolated areas. Uh, most evident, I would say, in, if you were to look, would be the, the blips in latency. Right, and although there was a dip, a corresponding dip in speed, um, but in response to that, uh, the internet, the internet service re provider response in terms of the um, the rate at which capacity was added uh, was I, I don't know if I can go so far as to say unprecedented, but it was uh, it, it was being added at an incredible rate, much much faster than uh, the rate at which capacity was being added to the interconnects over the previous three or four years, and I might add. 
capacity is being steadily added at those interconnects. But during this particular period, the ISPs responded quite quickly. And we saw that uh, as performance, you know, after that initial kind of stress in mid-March did sort of uh, return. I won't say it's normal, but, you know, it, it, it has sustained uh, the stress quite well. So essentially we have a stress test, um, which isn't a test at all. It's actually a, a real time event. Um, I, I, I mean, and it's global. Um, do you have any sense of like how other countries have, how the internet has performed in other countries, um, not just the US or just the global rise in traffic? Um, I think Matt can also speak to that as well. Um, some of the data in the BTAG report uh, actually brings to bear uh, some, of the res some of what was seen in other, other, other countries a little bit more than our report, which is really focused on US internet service providers. Uh, but there's actually some pretty good research on that uh, that was published in the Internet Measurement Conference this year. People did look at traffic volumes at internet exchange points and, and so forth. And uh, similar trends were observed in, in Europe, at least. Uh, Matt, uh, um, Matt, let me just go to you. You're, you're the, I guess, the co-author of, uh, of the BTAG, uh, BITAG report. Um, can you kind of comment on kind of the larger um, perspective on global traffic and how the network has performed? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm the lead editor, so it's a group paper. So, um, but um, we one of the papers we looked at, I think Nick referred to at the Internet uh, Measurement Conference, was uh, the Facebook team uh, published a paper, and uh, in that they they looked at uh, the performance across their global network, and what they saw was um, some interesting things in terms of the video delivery. And, uh, and the quality and what they saw was in um, some of the developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa had some issues. There are some issues in India and some issues in uh, South America with, you know, they're streaming their video. Uh, they didn't see that in the United States. So, I mean, which is consistent with a lot of the data that Nick and I looked at is, you know, that the networks overall in the US worked very well. There are, there are the corner cases and the exceptions but as a whole, it worked. And, um, but they, they, they showed a few different things that were kind of interesting where they talked about, they could observe, uh, they saw a correlation when um, the data that typically normally for video would come from a content delivery network directly into the network. And when there was a uh, poor video quality, what they started to see was that the, the traffic would overflow uh, the, uh, the direct interconnection and start to come in through the public uh, internet or the transit. And so there's, you know, it was kind of indicative of, you know, there was a problem and that they could see it. And, um, but it goes to kind of um, your leading question of, you know, it, you know, when people ask me, you know, the internet worked as designed through all of this, you know, and when you start to see the things where it starts to overflow onto um, uh, the, the public transit, that's what it's designed to do. And it's kind of a circuit breaker these days and for how it works. So, um. so, you know, we've been doing this conference and, you know, for 17 years, um, I think the, it, it flew out of, it, it flowed out of the, you know, congressional internet caucus briefings that we were doing on the Hill back in, until way back in 1996. And the idea was that the internet architecture was fundamentally different than, you know, other networks and what members of Congress back in the nineties couldn't understand it, maybe still don't, um, is that, you know, the architecture was fundamentally different. And um, I think what I, we wanted to do to stay the net was kind of figure out, just, just kind of highlight that you're saying that the internet and its architecture worked as promised and we've really never had an opportunity to really test it. Uh, yeah, and, but I think one of the things to, is to think about is if you even went back 20 years or even 10 years, how much the internet and the, the core of the internet has changed in the last 10 and 20 years, an event such as the, the pandemic of, uh, that's been going on in the, the shelter in place that we talked about in the spring and putting in the stress, that, that would have certainly had a, a very different experience if we went back 20 years ago compared to how it works now. And one of the reasons for that is the, uh, you know, when you start to look at some of the statistics, you know, the 90% uh, of the traffic these days is delivered via content delivery networks, at least for consumer ISPs, which helps greatly in you know, spreading out that load. And we didn't have nearly the pervasive uh, infrastructure of content delivery networks you know, in the early days of the internet. Yeah, and CDNs are like companies like Akamai and, and others, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, 
Um, Nick, can you have one of the big things that, um, you know, young people home um, doing a lot of gaming <laughs> um, uh, worry about is, is latency. And that's always been a factor when it comes to, you know, broadband and internet access. Um, and one of the reasons why, you know, um, geostationary satellite internet is really troublesome is because it just has terrible latency. Um, can you talk about like how latency performed during COVID? Absolutely. And I think, Tim, it's it's important to note that there are many different ways that you can look at those statistics. Uh, and the paper that I, I think you may have linked in the chat uh, shows a, a few of the different ways to slice that. Um, you can look, for example, at, at the FCC's Measuring Broadband America data, which has, has a you know, it's rich data set for, for exploring uh, things like latency. And you could look, for example, across the entire data set and look at averages. Okay. And um, we've shown we've shown that in the paper you can actually see uh, that um, during the during the period of, of uh, you know from mid March onward uh, in the FCC data the averages do uh, bump up just a little bit uh, uh, you know a couple of milliseconds and before dropping down to normal but averages as we know just hide things right they hide a lot of outliers and so I think it's helpful you know, to dig in further. And, you know, we do dig into that a little bit further in the paper. And I think what you can see in, in, in you know, by digging in further is that um, by and large, uh, you know, most customers, uh, you know, uh, were fine. Uh, there's a tail there. You know, if you look at basically the, the worst 5% of customers and, and the worst 1%, right, the so-called tail, then certain, you, certain subscribers, those subscribers on certain ISPs um, did see some pretty substantial effects. And, and some of the uh, data on that is, is in the paper. Um, I, I won't uh, you know, call out names right now, but you can, you can go look at the, the plots. And, um, and so like in, the, in that sort of outlier, right? The, the 1% for particular ISPs, those effects were pretty substantial. Um, I would note that we looked at this over sort of a, a multi-year period. And for some of those ISPs for which the effects were substantial, it wasn't like total meltdown, okay? It was sort of like um, a similar kind of, similar kinds of effects could be observed for some of those ISPs around Christmas time when everybody goes home and you know starts browsing the web and watching movies and shopping from the internet because they're not at work. Some ISPs saw the same kinds of effects at that time. And so, um, by and large, um, on I would say on average, the effect is observable. For most users, uh, latency was fine. For the unlucky one percent in a couple of ISPs, it was pretty noticeable, um, but but still pretty short lived. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like I, I don't didn't see like people just screaming that their internet was awful. Um, That's right. You know, in in my home, um, you know, I've three teenagers and, um, you know, I, I, I was expecting to everything to be ground to a halt um, and it didn't. And, and different applications take different you know, loads, right? Like um, Zoom is incredibly efficient um, as far it, while we're all video conferencing from home, um, it's incredibly efficient as far as video goes, but other applications are different. Matt, can you kind of talk about the, you know, the different loads that different applications do and how did, how did it, you know, ISPs and the network respond to that? Some, I mean, I, I think it's a good point that, you know, uh, you know, that the video today is adaptive, you know, Zoom does a really good job as do most of the other video conferencing, as does the video streaming. So when we look at, you know, it, it adapts to the bandwidth and the, the throughput available for the end user. And often it's not, you don't even notice it as the, as the end user that it's adapting. And, uh, and that's kind of an outgrowth of the engineers have they figured out how to make things work as opposed to thinking like how to make it work like the telephone network of trying to get a, like a constant bit rate. And so um, um, that was a good thing. Um, and one of the interesting things to note, you know, we, we everybody got concerned about, oh, we're all gonna go do video conferencing. What's that gonna do to the network? And it certainly had a very high growth uh, uptake, but when you actually look at the absolute numbers in terms of what the, the, the bulk of the traffic that got put onto the, the network, it was still video streaming and, and in the downstream was the, the largest contributor to the growth in the network on the traffic. And so, um, um, 
Yeah. So I think um, it, it's all interesting, and, but I, I think it's just a testament, the adaptiveness of how the, uh, the video conferencing and video streaming guys work is just, it's phenomenal. Jimmy, your question to me and the follow-up to Matt, I think illustrates a very important gap, particularly as we think about internet policy in this area, because there are the tests that are currently being run uh, by the FCC and others. And then there is the user experience as they use applications like Zoom and so on and so forth. And there's quite a bit of a gap right now between the design of those tests and uh, how particular applications, you asked me about gaming, right? Uh, Matt was talking about video conferencing. We don't have great standardized tests for, uh, or even an infrastructure in place right now to answer the questions about you know, how, how is Zoom performing across the US? Zoom probably knows, but then you could ask the same question about Netflix or YouTube or Hulu or whatever. And, you know, I think from a policy perspective, we need to really think hard about what the next generation of testing looks like in, in this space, because I think what we have right now is, is quite limited. Um, I, I think that we have a question from, um, in the Q&A from Sally Braun. Um, who, who's asking a, you know, a question that I had too, is like, how is capacity added? You know, how is broadband, in, broadband created? And you know, she admits that she's not an expert. So you know, she's kind of looking for, um, you know, just kind of like just the user's guide to how capacity is added. Um, sure, I'll, I'll take a stab. I mean, from, at least for the cable networks that I'm most familiar with, you know, you would first think, oh, capacity added that they're actually going out and like pulling a new cable or something. But um, often there there are things that are being done and we actually kind of typically call it an augmentation. So you can go do a, an adjustment to the network. And sometimes you're either just rerouting some stuff in the core, which the guys did a lot during this to um, to adapt to the, the shifts. But you can also go out and add some bandwidth through uh, some techniques where you basically readjust how the, the network is getting distributed and cable, we'll call that a node split. Uh, they sometimes change things like uh, modulation techniques uh, that you hear about often in the wireless networks, but in cable networks, we also do different kinds of modulations that, like radios and you can get more data through by changing some of those things. And so there's, there's a lots of different little tricks that the engineers can do uh, to add more capacity without actually physically going out and adding more network. So, you know, I guess, I guess the question I have, um, you know, kind of getting towards the end is, um, can, this is an incredible, like, God knows we, we, you know, would rather not have COVID, right? Um, but it's certainly better than a nuclear war. And I guess the question is, what, what lessons can our, our, you know, network engineers like you guys talking with others, um, to um, like figure out what lessons did we learn? Um, what are we gonna do differently as far as building these networks out? And um, is, that, is that community coming together? Um, because this has been a, a terrible gift. Um, I, I, I can jump in and Nick can jump in, but um, you know, there's, there's lots of evidence of uh, collaboration across the board between operators and content providers. I mean, you know, there's a, a great discussion at one of the North American network operator group meetings that they uh, live streamed where, um, you know, the, the engineers explained how they had their war rooms set up and, yeah, you know, they were, you know, texting and uh, communicating back and forth to make sure that content from content provider A was able to get to ISPs networks and, you know, oh, and if you need to make any adjustments, you know, they're doing those things in real time. Uh, there's evidence of collaboration, you know, even in, Europeans asking, you know, can uh, the streaming guys please slow down their streams for a little while to make sure nothing goes wrong over here in Europe because they were concerned. So I think um, one of the lessons uh, is just, you know, the collaboration works. I mean, and, and the community works. I mean, and, and it came together to work. I mean, it, it's usually always working, it just, and working together, but this, it just put a, a really fine point on it as the guys all came together in, in this situation. Nick? Yeah, Tim, this is a good question. I would kind of take it back to where you, where you started with the, you know, sort of observations about, uh, you know, early discussions being, you know, resilient to uh, fairly ca uh, catastrophic ca kinds of attacks. And there's certain aspects to the internet, particularly the design of some of the protocols that, that exhibit that type of resilience, 
right? If you take out a particular node, the routing protocols will figure out how to, how to you know, route around that or find a new path. Um, in response to congestion, you know, certain protocols will adapt so that the, the available capacity can be uh, more effectively shared. Now that's good in theory, um, but uh, you know, it, it really goes back to what, to what Matt said. You know, if the capacity is not there, it doesn't matter if the protocols can find another route. You know, the operators have to basically um, work together uh, to make sure that ca that capacity exists, make sure that the applications uh, respond uh, in, in ways that, that don't overload the existing capacity and use the capacity that's, that's there. And I think if, if, if one of the, I think one of the big lessons we can take away is the testament to the uh, collaborative cooperative nature of uh, the parties involved, the internet being a, a huge federation of a network of independently operated networks, the, the cooperation was, was tremendous. And then I'd leave it with again, where I kind of started, which was um, it, it, when you asked me about measurement, which is there are a lot of things that we actually don't have a great handle on. I mean, I think what if people had started complaining about their video conferencing? Thank heavens they didn't, right? What if people had started complaining about you know, their online classrooms and whatever? Thank heavens they didn't because we, we don't have, the research community doesn't have it. You know, the, the FCC doesn't have, we don't have a global repository of data that would allow us to answer questions about that. Individual companies do, but I think we're still for want of something that is sort of the version two or the modern day measuring broadband America that looks at application quality. All right, well, we don't have time. Um, we could do an entire panel or an entire day on broadband measuring and mapping. Um, and I'm not gonna open up that Pandora's box right now. Um, I think we'll save it for another time. But be, you, know, you know, one thing that you know, people in kind of that do internet policy meat and potatoes issues like we do and that we hash through at State of the Net, um, sometimes we, we don't spend enough time in the underlying technical groups. Um, and Matt mentioned the, the, the bit tag and others, but are you seeing people coming together and saying, you know, across all these different, you know, levels of the stack saying, there are a lot of lessons we learned here. Um, this is an interesting example. How can we build better structures or more structures um, to, to collaborate and share information on, on network performance going forward? I, I, I would say yes. Uh, I think um, it's, you know, there's still sort of a, it's still a bit of a constellation but, and Matt probably has his perspective on this too, that's a bit different from mine, but I would say, absolutely. Um, as, a re as an academic researcher, um, you know, I, I received funding from both the, the National Science Foundation, so our taxpayers, um, and also in industry, folks like Cable Labs and, and, and Comcast and other ISPs. And so it's, you know, I've, I've basically had the opportunity to have a foot both in, in the research community and with a direct perspective on operations through groups like the BTAG, through groups like NANOG, and um, you know the Internet Architecture Board and other other standards bodies like the ITF are also looking at this. I spend less time in those, but I think Matt and others in this community are there. So there are a lot of touch points. I don't. I wouldn't say that everybody's always in the same room, but there is definitely a lot of dialogue on this problem. Yeah. No. I, there's a there there has been and still is. You know, lots of groups. And that are looking at how do we capture the lessons learned? How do, you know, what do we need to do going forward to be better prepared? So, you know, I've helped write a few other reports along the same topics and, you know, I'll probably write a few others um, going forward as well. But, you know, it's a, it's a constant theme these days in the different working groups. Yeah, before, before I ask you guys to kind of close with some, you know, just a few, a minute of parting thoughts, um, you know, you're both former, you're both University of Chicago guys. Um, clearly, you both like to play guitar. Um, do you ever kind of collaborate with low latency on the network um, and with jam sessions? Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, we collaborate on technical things. We haven't tried our creative things yet. So um, maybe one day. I, I, a, I, as a, I, as a test. I mean, low, low latency doxis is here. So it's, it's, you know, it's definitely on the horizon. And so I'm looking forward to, uh, to future jam sessions. <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't, you know, obviously I didn't know before Steve the net that you guys um, were both enthusiasts. We would have had you like finish with a, 
with the session, but John, in, in lieu of that, can you- Next year, hopefully we're in person, but if not, you know, <laughs> during one of your stretch breaks, we can, we can jam. So. All right, all right. Um, just in with just one minute of closing thoughts on lessons learned and, you know, and maybe like, you know, things that didn't go well, but um, Matt, Nick? Uh, I think, uh, I think the, I don't know if there's a big takeaway for a lesson learned other than, yeah, I think that we, we saw that the internet worked uh, and, it, and it's, you know, and that the free markets and stuff, you know, prevailed. I, I would, I would, I would echo that. I mean, I think, um, you know, there were, there was certainly a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fanfare. I think we saw some, some pretty high profile articles with a testament to the, to the designers of the internet, uh, in terms of the, the resilience we saw and certainly, uh, credit is due there, but I think credit is even more due to the operators of the services and the ISPs, because as I said, the protocols are one thing, but if, if the capacity isn't there, if we're not putting in the infrastructure and, and provisioning it, it doesn't matter how good the protocol design is. Um, yeah. And I think, I think we saw that working really well. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I mean, uh, one thing that went unnoticed by a lot of people, I mean, to make all this work, I mean, it, the question earlier about adding augmentation and stuff. I mean, there were guys behind the scenes that were working hard either on, you know, running up and down data centers, doing things or guys out in trucks, you know, doing some things. So there, you know, a bunch of these people that were essential workers out there working really hard to make sure everybody's broadband was working. Uh, right now we're having some problem with the chat, um, but we're using Slack uh, to share uh, this information um, in the, the, Slack is at a, at a bit.ly link. It's um, bit.ly slash SOTN Slack, all one word at the end. So um, for those who um, aren't on Slack, I apologize. Mark Bohannon can email me for the paper. Um, I recommend you to uh, Nick's paper and to Matt's work. And I just want to thank you guys for participating um, in, in that kind of overview. This is really helpful for me. Um, and I don't think this was widely known. And that's why we wanted to host you guys today. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, to chat, Tim. It's 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 been fun. We'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks, fellas. Thanks. Okay.